A 78-year-old man recovered from COVID-19 in April, but in December, he was rushed to the emergency room so short of breath he was unable to speak and experiencing severe hypoxia or low oxygen. An investigation found that this man was reinfected with the B117 variant of SARS-CoV-2, sometimes called the UK variant. This is the first confirmed reinfection with the new variant. What does this mean? What does this tell us about the set of mutations in the UK variant? How did the doctors figure out this man was actually reinfected? What are scientists talking about when they say B117, D614G, or N501Y? Is this a new strain of the virus? What does this mean for viral transmission, immunity, and vaccines? In this video, I'm going to try to answer all those questions. We'll do that by taking a deep dive into the scientific literature. If you're someone who's curious and want to learn, buckle up because it's about to get nerdy. So here we go. So, to start, the case report we're talking about today has David Harrington, who is with the UK's NHS, as lead author. It was accepted and made available in the journal Clinical Infectious Diseases on January 9. It reports on a single case report of a 78-year-old male with several comorbidities receiving hemodialysis that was diagnosed with COVID-19 in April and was later diagnosed with COVID-19 on December 8th. I'll come back later to the details to examine how these doctors came to the conclusion that this was a reinfection. But before we can do that, we have to understand some basic concepts about viral mutations and define the correct terminology because there is a lot of incorrectly used terms in the media. Remember first that mutations arise as a natural byproduct of the errors that occur during viral replication. When a virus makes copies of itself, it makes mistakes. Among viruses, though, coronaviruses, which include SARS-CoV-2, actually make fewer mutations than most RNA viruses. This is because coronaviruses have an enzyme that corrects some of the errors made during replication. But mutations do occur, and if the change in the virus confers some competitive advantage in viral replication, transmission, or evading the immune system, the new version will likely increase in frequency. On the other hand, some mutations actually hurt the virus, and viruses containing those mutations will eventually stop circulating. So, when we see a particular mutation popping up more often in the population, it may be because it has a competitive advantage. However, some mutations might be found more commonly just by chance. For example, a founder effect occurs when a small number of individual viruses get established in a new population and see an outbreak possibly getting widely distributed in a superspreader event. In this case, the mutations that are present in the genomes of these viruses will dominate the population because they were first on the scene, regardless of their effects on viral fitness. So now that we've covered the mechanism of mutation, let's get some terminology straight. The terms mutation, variant, and strain are often used interchangeably in the media, but strictly speaking, they are referring to distinctly different things. Mutation refers to the actual change in the virus's nucleotide. That nucleotide mutation may lead to an amino acid change, which is sometimes called an amino acid mutation. An example would be the mutation that led to the D614G amino acid substitution, which became globally established by summer 2020. In D614G, a nucleotide mutation caused a change in the amino acid that is located at site number 614, part of the spike protein. The amino acid changed from aspartic acid, D, to glycine, G. So D changes to G at spot number 614, so D614G. Often you'll hear these terms like N501Y or E484K. This is what they're talking about, changes to the amino acids. Now, if there are a set of amino acid changes that make the virus's genome different in some meaningful way from other virus genomes, that new collection of mutations is called a variant and a family of variants can be called a lineage or clade. We're going to need those terms later. 
But what about strain? Is the UK variant a new strain of the coronavirus? No. A variant should only be called a strain when it is demonstrably and significantly different in the disease it causes, how it transmits, or how the immune system responds. To date, most virologists would agree that the changes that have occurred thus far to SARS-CoV-2 have not substantially altered how the virus interacts with the host, so no new strains exist. So, make a virologist happy. Call it a variant, not a strain. Now, one last thing. Before we talk about the reinfection, we have to cover one more terminology issue, which is the naming systems for the variants of SARS-CoV-2. For example, maybe you've heard of B117 and N501YV1. Are these different? No, it's just two different names for the same thing. Most commonly, there are three nomenclature systems in use. Those are the pangolin lineage system, the nextrain clade system, and the gizade clade system. Each system looks at the genomic sequence of a virus sample and then assigns that virus to a group based on the shared mutations in the virus. What can make this confusing is that each system has a different set of names for their groups and each groups the mutations a little differently. So there are at least three different names for a variant of SARS-CoV-2 depending on which system you're using. And by the way, Pangolin has nothing to do with the animal. It's an acronym for the Phylogenetic Assignment of Named Global Outbreak Lineages. This is somewhat confusing since the animal pangolin was once considered a possible zoonotic host for the virus. So let's look at how each of these systems would classify the UK variant. If we use the pangolin system, it's called the B117 variant. So when you hear that in the news, that name comes from this lineage system. In the pangolin system, there was originally the A lineage, then B, then B1, and also B111, and so on. As of 2021, almost all circulating virus is B1 something. If we use the next strain system, however, this would be called 20I clade, or 20I slash 501YV1. The 20 comes because it emerged in the year 2020, and it was the ninth defined clade, so letter I. Then, finally, using the Gizade clade system, this variant falls within the large group of GR. You can always use Wikipedia to help you keep it straight. Anyway, none of these names really roll off the tongue, so it's not surprising why most media has just called it the UK variant. The B117 variant contains a number of notable mutations, including nine changes to the very important spike protein as well as more in other gene areas. Notably, several mutations affect the virus's receptor binding domain, or RBD. The RBD is a key part of the virus located on its spike that allows the virus to dock to receptors in the human body to gain entry into cells and lead to infection. These RBDs are also the primary targets for some treatments and vaccines. So changes to the RBD could have serious ramifications going forward. Interestingly, two different variants one widespread in the UK, 20 and one widespread in South Africa, 20H, both of these have multiple changes to the RBD. And this is one of the reasons these two variants have captured so much attention by scientists. So now that we have taken a crash course on mutations and nomenclature, let's talk about the reinfection report. Let's start by saying that this is not the first reinfection of SARS-CoV-2 to be documented. Several other cases have been reported, but it is the first one reported with the B117 variant. So here's the case report. A 78-year-old English man with type 2 diabetes, COPD, and heart disease, and who required regular hemodialysis, presented with fever on April 2, 2020. A combined nose and throat swab was collected and tested for viral RNA using RT-PCR that targeted two different gene segments. Both targets came back positive with a relatively low CT value of 26, indicating a viral load consistent with active infection. With only a fever, though, he was discharged home and his recovery was uneventful. But since he was receiving hemodialysis and had to come for that treatment regularly, he was tested a total of 22 times from May 5th to December 1 through the dialysis center. All tests came back negative. 
Over that same period, his blood was tested for antibodies using an IgM-IgG assay. Six times he was tested, and in each case, antibodies were detected with no evidence that the antibodies were waning. But then on December 8th, a rapid qualitative PCR test came back positive. Follow-up analysis with RT-PCR confirmed the positive test. Just like in April, both target RNA segments came back positive. So clearly, the man was infected in April, subsequently developed some antibodies, but was later infected a second time. On December 14th, he was rushed to the emergency room with extreme shortness of breath, unable to talk, and severe hypoxia. So, to understand why a man who was previously infected and exhibited antibodies was sick again, whole genome sequencing was done for both the sample from April 2nd, which was kept in storage, and the sample from December 8th. When they sequenced the genome of the virus from April 2nd, they were able to classify it as B2 using pangolin, which is also 19A using X strain or V in the Gizeg clade system. If we look at these groups of variants, we find that this form of the virus was pretty similar to the original Wuhan version. And importantly, it had no mutations on the spike protein. On the other hand, the sample collected on December 8th was classified as the B117 variant that we already talked about with its 9 amino acid changes to the spike protein. Is this the first and only case of reinfection? No, of course not. In fact, it's likely this happens more often and is never detected, or we just don't have enough information to draw conclusions. But this case was unique for two reasons. First, because the man was receiving dialysis, he was being tested regularly, so we can say with good confidence it was not some latent infection or reactivation. There were 22 negative tests in between. Secondly, because this clinic had in-house genomic sequencing capabilities and the UK is overall one of the best for sequencing its samples, we can see that the variants were distinctly different. So what does all this mean for immunity? First, we can't know yet whether this reinfection was due to waning immunity or due to the virus's ability to evade the immune response. This was a high-risk individual with multiple comorbidities on the one hand, but anti-SARS-CoV-2 antibodies were still present shortly before the onset of reinfection, with no evidence of antibody waning. Second, the fact that this individual got more severe illness from the second reinfection does not indicate that this new variant causes more severe disease. That may instead be due to other factors. So, in conclusion, this case report gives pretty compelling evidence that reinfection can occur especially from phylogenetically different forms of SARS-CoV-2. This is something we knew already, but because this particular variant contains so many spike protein variations, it also raises questions about possible immune escape and or vaccine evasion. Studies are feverishly underway to understand how these mutations affect immunity and vaccines. You may want to check out this article in Nature that discusses some of the issues, which is linked in the description. I'll close with a quote from virologist Angela Rasmussen at the Georgetown Center for Global Health Science and Security. Writing about the response to the B117 variant, she wrote, We should focus on encouraging compliance with proven interventions and emphasize the additive nature of risk reduction, sometimes called the Swiss cheese approach. We must balance scientific uncertainty with sensible approaches that we already know are effective at reducing community transmission, regardless of what we learn about B117. Dramatic measures put in place through fear and uncertainty squander an opportunity to increase participation in the measures that are known to reduce transmission. Leaders and policymakers should calmly educate and engage the public. That's it for today's video. Stay curious and learn something new every day. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.